Apparently we don't need roads. This is your host, Joy Cruel, and you are listening to Relentless Flashbacking. In every episode, I will travel back to a certain year of the past, and I'll talk about its historical events, stuff, toys, cars, TV, movies, and music. You'll find Relentless Flashbacking on Mixcloud, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. With this episode, I'll travel back to 1979, and I'll talk about the news and the TV. The 70s are a great decade. The spring before the 80s summer. Sure, there are also dark sides, but 1979 proves that the 70s are far out and groovy. In 1979, there is a low level of terrorist activities, but there are still seven attacks on the western soil. Three of these attacks, luckily, are without fatalities. Two of them are in the United States and one in Norway. One of these incidents, however, shouldn't be underestimated. A bomb explodes on the flight 444, flying from Chicago to Washington DC, and the culprit is Una Bomber, a madman who has been terrorizing the United States States since 1978. This is the third full action, and it's only the beginning, since there will be 13 more senseless bombings until his capture in 1996. The worst attacks happen for the Basque conflict in Spain and for the troubles in Great Britain and Ireland. In Madrid, three bombs explode simultaneously, killing seven people and wounding more than 100. While in the Anglo Irish attacks, there are 24 victims. In 1978, the Iranian revolution began and although it overthrown the Shah and the monarchy, it will lead to a devastating evolution of human rights. The West will soon notice it when the Iranians surround and attack the American embassy. Then they capture a marine, Kenneth Krauss, who will be tortured to have sensitive information. The siege ends after three hours, but the struggle to get Krauss safe and sound lasts for a week. And finally the boy will land in Washington DC. But when the USA welcomes the Shah, the Iranians to avoid a second American interference as in 1953, demand extradition. USA refuses, and the Iranian response is sudden and brutal. Anti-American protests lead, in November, to a second siege of the American embassy, and 66 diplomats and officials are held hostage. Back in USA, as always, there is a severe surge of racism against Iranians. Any circumstance is good to be a violent and ignorant racist. This crisis will not last days. It will not last month, but it will last until 1981, for 444 long days. It stands as the longest hostage crisis in recorded history. After 13 days, only 13 people are released, while 53 hostages remain held. In 1980, US President Carter will order Operation Eagle Claw, a daring and ill-organized rescue operation that will disastrously end with the death of of eight US soldiers and zero results. But in the same year, Richard Quinn, seriously ill, will be released. In 1981, finally USA and Iran will sign an agreement over the hostages, and all the 52 hostages will come back home. At the same time, in 1979, there is another odyssey in Iran. Only six American diplomats escaped from the embassy sieg and are secretly harbored by Canadians. To let them escape from Iran, an elaborate plan will be prepared. CIA will use a failed movie project called Argo, inspired by Roger Zelazny's science fiction novel Lord of Light, and they will build a strong background, such as advertising with a movie poster and even a fake office for the fake Studio 6 productions. Two CIA agents will join the six diplomats in Tehran to form a fake scouting crew for the movie Argo, so finally, more than two months after the embassy sieg, the six diplomats will escape from Iran in January of 1980. There is a really weird coincidence. The Iranian hostage crisis will last 444 days, and it begins in November. And just 11 days after, Una Bomber puts a bomb on a plane. Do you remember the flight number that I mentioned earlier? The flight is 444. That's only a weird coincidence, but it's really unsettling. 
this year the infamous Three Mile Island nuclear accident takes place. Due to inadequate training, on March 28, 1979, there is a radioactive leak. The cost of the cleanup will be over a billion dollars and will last until 1993. There aren't victims, but there will be an ongoing debate on the health effects on the long term. Using nuclear power as a source of energy is one of the greatest foolery ever taught by humanity. Not only for the fact that that we don't know how to manage the waste, but also for the accidents, because a total safety cannot exist as is demonstrated by this accident and those that will occur in the future, such as the infamous Chernobyl accident. Unlike any other technology, the consequences can be devastating and with a long term. Using a technology that you haven't completely mastered is pure criminal madness. It's clear that money is more important than human life, because you have to be blind to not see that a one-way ticket, there will be a point of no return. At least this incident is a significant turning point in the global development of nuclear power. Following the event, the number of reactors under construction in the USA declined. The 1979 Three Mile Island accident didn't initiate the demise of the US nuclear power industry, but it did halt its historical growth. We know that sometimes life is stranger than fiction, and the China Syndrome movie is released only 12 days before the disaster and it's a thriller about a nuclear disaster and it's condemned by the nuclear power industry because it can instigate a phobia about something that will never happen talking about the last famous words shortly after the three mile island nuclear accident the activist group called musicians united for safe energy is formed by jackson brown graham nash bonnie ray harvey wasserman and johnny hall they organize a series of five non-nukes concerts and they choose a prestigious location, the Madison Square Garden, with a lineup of music legends such as Bruce Priesting, Crosby, Steel and Nash, and many others. Right in this year, Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, is elected, and she will be the United Kingdom's Prime Minister until 1990. Thatcher is the first woman to hold this position, and the Reagan-Thatcher duo will mark the Western civilization of the 80s. Thatcher will be harshly criticized both for her economic and foreign policies. Except for future battles in Africa, the Western civilization is living a period of peace since 1975. But in the meantime, the USSR invades Afghanistan. This act of war will have great consequences in the future. This invasion led the USA to refuse to ratify SALT II, a treaty to restrict certain weapons both in the USSR and the USA, but at the end, both nations will respect the treaty. The two twin space probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, were sent into space in 1977, and in 1979 they arrived near Jupiter, exploring the planet and its satellites. They discover, for the first time, the planet Jupiter rings. What's amazing is that the two probes will still travel in, in 2019. The Pioneer 11 probe, launched in 1973, this year reaches Saturn, and its journey will end in 1995. Finally, Stephen King publishes one of his best books, The Dead Zone. After the post-apocalyptic genre of the previous novel, The Stand, Stephen King continues to avoid horror with this supernatural thriller. The premise is simple. Johnny, after a car accident, falls into coma. When he wakes up, part of his brain is dead, but this dead zone gives him a power of clairvoyance and precognition. What initially seems a gift will begin to be a problem when he will discover Cover something that no one will want to accept. The book is a masterpiece and it leaves you breathless and with a big question what you will do if you are in his place. Cronenberg will direct a movie adaptation in 1983 and, a rare case for a King adaptation, it will be a masterpiece. Then, in 2002, there will be a TV series that will last for six seasons, really too much for a show undeniably edgeless. It will be cancelled without even an ending. Please avoid it and read the book and watch the 1983 movie. 
After two masterpieces, Foreigner delivered the third one, Head Games. As always, the guitarist Mick Jones and the singer Lou Graham show their compositional abilities, more brilliant than ever, and the title track implied that soon Foreigner will paint their hard rock with even more AOR. The only low points on the album are three tracks on the B-side, The Modern Day, Blinded by Science and Do What You Like. Luckily, the last track of the B-side, Rev on the Red Line, put the energy back and it's a grand finale. The cover is weird, the photo is in a man's toilet. There is the 14 years old actress Lison Falk with a worried or scared expression on her face, hopefully dressed, and she's erasing the word Deary White Boy. And on the wall there are other writings, you can find all the song titles from the A side, and then there is also double vision from the previous album. Why there aren't the songs from the B side? And what the hell this senseless cover means? There aren't any answers. And now here is Foreigner with Deary White Boy. In this section I'll talk about TV. There is a bad news. The talented Ted Cassidy, best known for the role of Lurch on the Adams Family from 64 to 66, dies at 46 for complications after heart surgery. In 1979, on TV, since 1962, there is The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson on NBC and there is the end of the second season of Second City TV an outstanding season with a glorious cast, with comedy legends like John Candy, Eugene Levi, Catherine O'Hara and Errol Ramis. The Saturday Night Live ends the fourth season. Here the cast is glorious too, with more comedy legends like Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, Jane Cartin, Bill Murray and Gilda Radner. Among the hosts there are Michael Palin, Gary Busey and Milton Berle. And let's not forget the special guests Andy Kaufman. Among the memorable sketches there is the one called Pepsi Syndrome that of course is related to the movie China Syndrome and to the Three Mile Island nuclear accident and then there is the Oscar prediction with Bill Murray and he gets right when he says that John Voight and Jane Fonda will win best actor and best actress with the drama coming home then the fifth season arrives we still have Jane Cartin, Bill Murray and Gilda Radner from the previous season but there are some new faces like the unfortunate Forgettable Henry Shearer. Among the hosts there are Steve Martin, Eric Idle and Martin Sheen. And of course there is still Andy Kaufman that randomly appears. And moreover among the musical guests there are Randy Newman and David Bowie. After four seasons Starsky and Dutch, one of the most regarded 70s TV series, ends. But we still got four big TV series that remain on TV with brand new seasons. Rockford Files since 1974, The Jeffersons since since 1975, Chips since 1977 and Taxi since 1978. Meanwhile, there is a war between the three American giants, ABC, CBS and NBC, that they release a barrage of TV series and the majority of them will die fast, with only few aired episodes. Many of these new TV series are lame, but there are two interesting series. On CBS there is the sitcom Working Stiffs, with the newcomers James Belushi and Michael Keaton. Only nine episodes are produced, but after four episodes aired, it's cancelled. It's a pity that it can be found on the web, because it looks promising and fun. Another short-lived series is The Associates on ABC, with a young Martin Short that's already magnificent and explosive. You can find it and watch it, it's enjoyable but something is missing to make it memorable. Only 13 episodes are produced, but after 9 episodes aired, the series is cancelled too. And who knows, maybe with time it would improve. In the midst of all this confusion, there is a legendary TV series. Welcome to Hazard County. Modern day Robin Hood. 
the Dukes of Hazard take us into the hot and colorful southern United States in the county of Hazard. The protagonists are the members of the Duke family. Uncle Jesse, a bearded and gruff gentleman who whips his troublesome nephew into shape. The three cousins, Bo, Luke and Daisy. Luke is the more mature of the two cousins, while Bo is the most instinctive and they found themselves perpetually in trouble. If they don't look for them, the troubles will find them. Daisy is clever and aware of her pleasant appearance, and although she has a provocative look, she's not an easy girl, and although she is sometimes naive, she knows how to get out of trouble. The two villains are Boss Hogg and his right hand man, the sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. The first is the richest man in the county and he is greedy, dishonest and corrupt, while the sheriff Roscoe is instead the classic bumbling henchman, submissive and sometimes stupid. The painting is completed with Cooter, a mechanic who often helps the dukes, and the two other policemen, Cletus and Inos equally stupid and pathetically in love with Daisy. The opening theme, Good Old Boys, is sung by one of the heroes of the country music, Waylon Jennings, and the lyrics say a lot about who the Dukes are. In fact, the title describes them perfectly, as it's an American slang that refers to a person that lives in rural areas in the southern United States, characterized by humility and by a good old-fashioned soul. The premise of the TV series is simple, the two Duke cousins are on probation because they were carrying moonshine, which is illegal alcohol, a common practice in the southern uh, United States, and in almost every episode they try to blow up some illegal boss hog moves, so he tries to get them arrested to get rid of them. And then let's go with the car chases on dirty roads, chases made legendary by the iconic Duke's car, an orange 1968 Dodge Charger, called General Lee, like the Confederate general, complete with a Confederate flag on the roof. And to complete this picture, the horn plays 12 notes of the Dixie hymn. The series takes inspiration from Moonrunners, a 1975 movie written by the creator of the TV series. There are a lot of similarities, and the most interesting one is that the car was called Traveler, and not General Lee. Traveler is the name of the General Lee horse. In recent times, many people have accused the TV series of being a racist show for all these comfort symbols. But as usual, we go from one extreme to the other without carefully analyzing and judging the context. It's clear that in the whole show there is no trace of racism, just think that among the Duke's friends there are also African Americans, and even with the villain Boss Hogg there aren't any problems. In fact we see African Americans in his restaurant, the Boss Nest, without incurring in unpleasant situations. The Confederacy and all its symbolism, such as the infamous flag, however, represents a dark moment in the United States history, and the flag is used by fools with antisocial and racist ideas. So why the Duke boys use all these symbols so lightly? The answer is easy. The TV series is full of southern stereotypes, such as the banjo score, the moonshiners, and this affection for a south that never existed. A nostalgic idea of the confederacy as a symbol of independence and rebellion and not racism. And in fact, the Dukes are rebels who are fighting the system like modern Robin Hood. The show isn't racist. But it comes from a time where people aren't aware of the weight of certain really negative symbols. The show will become popular, but there will be not a fair salary adjustment. So the actors that play Bo and Luke, after some filled negotiations, will leave the show during the fifth season. In 1982, the two cousins, Bo and Luke, will be replaced by two other cousins, Coy and Vance. Although they will not be as iconic as their cousins, Bo and Luke, it will be a shame losing them when Bo and Luke will be back. It will be a missed opportunity. Keeping all the four cousins could have spiced up the episodes. The TV series will continue until 1985 with seven seasons and will mark so much the TV and the pop culture that it will spawn a spin-off with one of the policemen, Enos, a cartoon produced by Anna and Barbera, two movies with the original cast, one in 1997 and one in 2000, then two disgusting remakes in 2005 and 2007, video games and an endless list of merchandising. They will 
be even a museum operated by the actor who plays Cooter. In the USA, the typical denim shorts will be called the Daisy Dukes, because the character of the show brought them to public attention, further proof of the impact of this TV series. The Dukes of Hazard is perfect for fun, and yes, it's practically a live-action cartoon, but the characters are so kind, the plots are always edifying and nobody gets hurt. And the particular thing is that although there is a rivalry between the Dukes and Boss Hogg and the Sheriff Roscoe, they often join their forces to deal with an external and greater danger. It's a perfect formula, car chases and good feelings. What more could you want? Let's remain in the South with the Southern Rock Veterans, ZZ Top. After a two-year hiatus, they published the follow-up for Theas, a masterpiece from 1976. The new album is called The Gayo, and it's dirty and bad as expected. The trio meet up again after years, and they discover that Gibson and Hill grew chest-length beards. This choice wasn't planned, but this new look will become a trademark of the band. Their dusty sound takes us on the long roads that cross Texas. The Gayo relentlessly travels, except Except for the Manic Mechanic, a weird track that echoes the Frank Zappa attitude and the down tempo a full for your stockings. The Gayo is a masterpiece that you should own. With this album the episode ends. In the next episode I'll talk about stuff, toys and cars from 1979. Please subscribe to the channel and follow the show on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. If you want to give your support, please visit Teespring and Patreon. Relentless flashbacking is easy to find because the name is unique all over the web. And now, from the Degayo album, here is ZZ Top with I'm Bad, I'm Nationwide. Stay outrageous, stay larger than life, Romeo Foxtrot, bravo!